Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for the homes in which we are nurtured and for the love of our mothers and fathers. We thank you for the new birth that Christ offers us through your love. We ask for strength and confidence to serve you in our families, our church, and our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. You've just met one of our new ministers, Jenna Anderson. You'll be meeting uh, all of them uh, after this service out uh, in the front of the uh, sanctuary and welcoming four wonderful new Christian leaders to our community of faith. Uh, if you look at the uh, insert in your bulletin, you'll see some more information about Through the Bible in the Year. I know one of the highlights of that uh, experience has been for many of you, uh, Dr. Brewster's weekly study on Wednesday evenings, uh, when uh, you will have a chance to visit with him and he with you uh, about uh, the uh, service, the sermon that's upcoming. You'll also see there on that page the uh, Summer Reading Club announcement, as well as the uh, special uh, symbols of spirituality that our children will be experiencing. I, I can remember when summer was a lax time in the church. Well, that is obviously not so anymore. Look at the backside of, of that uh, insert and you'll see uh, some uh, special announcements about the back to school uh, situation. We're joining the entire Fort Worth community this year. And whereas uh, last year we helped uh, over 1,500, this year we're going to participate in uh, helping clothe uh, 10,000 uh, children. You'll see down there that uh, your help is needed, both in a financial way and a volunteer way on that uh, day when we do this on uh, July the 30th the day before and Saturday, July the 30th, we will need volunteers to help uh, distribute the, uh, the things and uh, meet with the uh, young people. You'll also see the announcement about Vacation Bible School. If you have children or grandchildren, that is going to be uh, an exceptionally fine program uh, for this coming year. Uh, you saw the uh, insect repellent um, uh, gathered uh, there in the um, Welcome Center. More is needed, so during the week, if you forgot yours this morning, feel free to um, bring it on. Uh, the return of the Bubba's was talked enough about last week for three or four months, so uh, 
uh, I just uh, would encourage the men of our congregation to bake a couple of pies and participate. It's a lot of fun, and, uh, and uh, we hope you'll be participating. I, I wanted to call attention uh, this morning to the flowers. Uh, annually, uh, the young Mrs. Dillard uh, buys these flowers for our enjoyment and to help our worship in memory of her husband and her late father-in-law, both a wonderful uh, gentleman whom many of you will remember. And Sunday after Sunday, uh, you all bless our worship by providing these wonderful flowers for us, and we are grateful for them. Thank you. The Old Testament lesson this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations for you, and kings shall come from you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. 
Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was so excited about the announcements, I forgot to ask you please to pass the attendance forms. And for you who will be joining our church today, we ask you please to fill out one of the purple cards, today cards, and bring it forward. It is indeed a high and holy moment when families invite us to baptize their infants. And this morning, Christy and Daniel Riker have asked us to baptize Annie, and we invite Annie and her family to come to the chancel now. These receiving this sacrament are initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God. Remember the words of Jesus, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union? with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Annie Rainier in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Annie Rainier, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you all would place your hands on her. Annie Rainier, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's turn around here. There we go. <laughs> Annie is the newest member of the household of faith, and we welcome her with open arms and open hearts. And we give thanks for the opportunity that we have to participate in nurturing her as a community of faith. We, together, also vow uh, to do all in our power to uphold and care for her in the faith along with her parents so that at some point she will stand at this or some other altar and make her own profession of faith in Christ. And all this is God's great gift offered to us without price. And all of us have a responsibility here. With God's help, we, we will so order our, our lives after the example of Christ that it is so surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. She's just precious. I hate to give her back.
just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. From you, let my vindication come. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night. Concerning what others do, I have avoided the ways of the violent by following your word. There is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
God of new beginnings and covenants of faith and hope, we bow before you in awe and wonder this day, surrounded by your overflowing love and grace. We stand astonished at the beauty of your creation, revealed in the miracles of those seated around us today, at the provisions you create from your good earth that sustain us, and the vastness of your revealed and unrevealed universe. So with grateful hearts, we offer you our worship and praise for bringing us together this morning in your holy presence. We thank you that we can seek to love and serve you because you first reach out to us with your love. We can seek to love, forgive, and serve our neighbor because by your grace, we are constantly loved, forgiven, and cared for by you. Remind us again today of the covenant relationship we share with you and with one another. A covenant Jeremiah discovered long ago that would be written on the heart, establishing that you would be our God and we would be your people and all may come to know you. A covenant of faith that you shared centuries ago with Abraham and Sarah, with Noah, Ruth, Peter and Lydia and other disciples. A common bond is covenant that we share together this morning in the teachings, the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and that spirit that empowers and guides each of our lives. Today, Lord, we accept and renew this covenant of faith, seeking to love you with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds and with all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, to care for the ill and the grieving, the hungry and the homeless, the overwhelmed and discouraged, and all who stand in harm's way this day through the varied gifts and graces that you've given each one of us to serve. We also pray this morning for all of the churches within our annual conference and beyond who are experiencing pastoral and staff changes. We thank you for the new beginning and covenant we make this morning with this congregation and our new and returning staff, especially grateful today for the leadership of Dr. Tim Brewster. Bless and guide us on our journey of faith together and on this special Father's Day, we pause to thank you for our fathers and for all those men who have served as role models for us throughout our lives, at home, at church, at school, in our children and youth ministries, and wherever they have been present, guiding us to lives of health and wholeness. These prayers and the other prayers unmentioned on each of our hearts, we lift before you today as we share together in praying our common prayer of faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. New Testament lesson comes from Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Just as Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see. Those who believe are descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Happy Father's Day to you this morning. Happy Father's Day to our fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and all those who are fathers to us, have been fathers to us, have been mentors and have guided us in a way that has helped us on our life's journey. Happy Father's Day to all of you. It's also a wonderful day because we welcome new members of our church staff this morning. I want to introduce uh, them to you and uh, introduce their families to you as well. I'll begin with uh, Jenna Schmidt Anderson. Uh, Jenna uh, is from Tulsa and went to TCU. She started out as an education major at TCU, uh, received her call to ministry there and changed to a religion major. Uh, she was a part of this congregation for three years and worked as a volunteer in our youth department. So a number of people know her here as Jenna Schmidt. But on the third Saturday in May, uh, she married Jeff Anderson. And uh, Jeff, if you would stand, please. Jeff is a financial analyst. And Jeff, we welcome you as well. Jenna, the second weekend in May, graduated from Perkins School of Theology. May was a busy month for Jenna. And uh, she uh, received her uh, Master's of Divinity from Perkins. Jenna, welcome. Great to have you. Brian Bellamy uh, comes to us as an intern. He grew up in Fort Worth in the uh, Genesis United Methodist Church. Uh, he went to University of Texas at Arlington, receiving his degree in communications and public relations. Uh, he then went to Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, uh, where he has finished all of his classwork and now during this year has a year of internship here with us as a clergy intern. And um, Brian, we welcome you. We welcome Chuck Graff also. Uh, Chuck uh, is from Tecumseh, Nebraska, went to the University of Nebraska at Kearney, receiving his degree in business education. He then went uh, to serve as dean of a school in Laredo as a missionary there where he uh, taught and coached and was also, can you guess he coached basketball by the way? <laughs> it's one of the sports. Uh, he also uh, uh, kept a, uh, uh, took care of a dorm uh, full of boys as well. Uh, he is fluent in Spanish from those five years of missionary work and has maintained uh, that fluency. He then went to uh, Aleph uh, School of Theology in Denver where he received his Master's of Divinity degree. Uh, he served churches in Nebraska and in this annual conference served at First Church Grapevine on the staff there and then as pastor of Davis Memorial. Uh, his wife is Peggy. Peggy is organist at First United Methodist Church of Grapevine, is also a choral director at Birdville High School. And Peggy and Chuck have two children, Sonia and Jonathan. And uh, Peggy, would you stand and let us greet you as well? <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. And then Phyllis McDougall. Phyllis is a native of Sanger, Texas and uh, went to the University of North Texas where she received her elementary uh, education degree and then to Texas Women's University where she received her master's in early childhood education and then to Perkins School of Theology. In 1997, she, was, she became a diac consecrated a diaconal minister and in the year 2000 became a, full, a deacon in full connection in the Central Texas Annual Conference. Uh, Phyllis is uh, oh, uh, Phyllis is married to Douglas, and uh, Douglas is a CPA, and they have three children, and they are Miles, who is 16, Trevor, who is 13, and Hunter, who is 6. And if you all would stand and let us welcome you as well.
And I should add that Phyllis uh, has served at uh, Overton Park United Methodist Church and at uh, Keller, at the First United Methodist Church of Keller. And Phyllis, we're so glad to have you here. Phyllis will be Associate Director of Children's Ministries. Jenna will be working with uh, young adults and college ministries. Chuck in evangelism uh, and also in men's ministry and he will be working as well with hospitality uh, ministries. And, uh, and then Brian, of course, as our intern, will be involved in many uh, areas in the life of our church, uh, kind of getting experience all around. He will be supervised by Linda McDermott uh, as he uh, uh, goes through this year of internship. And again, we welcome all of you. I'm glad that you're here. Well, we uh, are continuing our way through the Bible. Uh, we are in our daily readings now in Exodus, but we're lingering a little longer in Genesis on Sunday morning as we uh, have before us the text that relates to the covenant between God and Abraham and Sarah. It's important that we talk about covenant because throughout the pages of Scripture, both in the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, we hear about covenant over and over and over again. A covenant is a very special kind of relationship. It's not really exactly like a contract because in a contract, uh, each party is bound by that contract as long as the other party uh, does what the other party is supposed to do. For example, if I contract with somebody to build a house, I pay them so much money, they build a house and I get the house. If they don't build the house, I don't owe them the money. If I don't pay the money, I don't get the house. That's the nature of a contract. But a covenant is a much more radical kind of relationship in the biblical sense, the way the word covenant is used. And that is each party is bound to the covenant, period. Doesn't matter what the other party does. It's unrelated to the participation or the faithfulness of the other party. Each party is bound to the covenant. It's a radical kind of relationship. So radical, in fact, that it is sealed in, uh, in a, a ritual of animal sacrifice, where animals would be sacrificed and placed and, and cut in half, and the halves would be placed apart, and the parties in the covenant would walk between the halves of the animals. Which is why when we speak in Hebrew of making a covenant, we talk about cutting a covenant. Covenant is cut. It is a special kind of relationship. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, we find that Abram is instructed to cut animals in two and animal sacrifice and then he falls into a deep sleep and there is, it says, a deep and terrifying darkness that comes over him and he has this vision of a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passing between the halves of the animals. Now for us, our modern eyes read that and think, what in the world is going on? What's going on is a vision of God making a covenant. God is represented by fire and smoke over and over again, powerful symbols of the presence of God. And in this vision, God makes the covenant. God walks between the halves of the sacrificed animals. God makes this covenant with Abram and Sarah, and we see that covenant unfold and we see it made in several different ways. We see the story told from different writers in Genesis. But at its heart, the covenant is, I will be faithful to you, God says. I will be your God. And I will bless you and you will be the ancestors of multitudes of people. And your descendants will bless the world. I will be your God. You will be my people. We see that phrase over and over and over again in Scripture. That's the basic 
covenant. Now, what do we learn from this covenant? It is a covenant of faith. At its heart is faith and faithfulness. And I want us to think about that just for a few minutes this morning. What does that mean for us today? A covenant of faith and faithfulness. Well, first we see that, this, that in this covenant, we see very clearly that God is always faithful. Whatever evidence there may be to the contrary, God is faithful. And what seems to be impossible is not impossible. God makes it possible. God is faithful and God is trustworthy. We see that so clearly. When we first meet Abram and Sarah, they're, Abram's 75 years old. They leave their homeland because God calls them to a new land. At 75, they go uh, to this new land and they are promised that they will be the parents of, of many, the ancestors of a great nation. And for 25 years, they live with that promise. For 25 years, they live in the assurance that God is faithful in spite of evidence to the contrary. Every year that passes, they're older and older and older. And here they are in the 17th chapter, 99 and 90. And God is faithful. And God says, again, you will be the ancestors of multitudes. And Sarah will bear a son. It's hard for us to understand how difficult not being able to have children was in that culture. We understand the difficulty of it today, don't we? We know the pain of parents who, or people who want to be parents and they're unable to have children. And uh, there are those in this congregation who know that experience. But in that culture, multiply it 10 times because all wrapped up in that is issues of uh, shame if you're unable to have a child. It is the way that your life is carried on in your descendants. It's very critically important. And here they are, 99 and 90 years old, and they've been living with this promise for a long time, and all evidence is it'll never happen. And then God announces that Sarah will have a son. And what does Abraham do? In the 17th verse, we read that he falls on his face laughing. Natural reaction. It's a joke. This can't happen. It's ridiculous. The very thought of it. He falls on his face laughing. In the 18th chapter, it's Sarah who laughs as she hears those words that she will have a child. But then over in the 21st chapter, when the child is born, he is named Isaac, which means he laughs. Isaac. And the laughter there is not laughter of derision, not laughter that feels like a cruel joke, but it's laughter of joy as the covenant is fulfilled. Now in our lives, there are times when it seems like we've been abandoned. There are difficult times when we're carrying burdens that feel greater than we can carry. There are times when we feel lonely, when we feel weighed down, and when we feel like we're barely hanging on to hope. The good news is God's faithfulness God's faithfulness, even when the evidence points in another direction. God is faithful. And because God is faithful, we can trust God. The very heart of the covenant is faithfulness and faith. And faith is better understood as trust. It's an active trust in God. It's not a passive believing certain things to be true. It is an active 
trust in God. And we see it so clearly as Abraham and Sarah leave their homeland and go to a land where they're really strangers. As they live with the promise for 25 years, as they inherit the promise throughout, there is this underlying trust. And Abraham and Sarah are often depicted throughout scriptures as our ancestors in faith, in trust. God is completely trustworthy. The second thing that, uh, that we see in Abraham and Sarah is that faith, that relationship with God is transforming, radically transforming. Being in covenant with God and, and understanding God's faithfulness and living in that faithfulness and trusting God completely transforms us and makes us new. That's why Abram and Sarah get a new name, each of them. Abraham, which means exalted ancestor, exalted father, becomes uh, Abram becomes Abraham, which means father of multitudes, ancestor of multitudes. Sarai becomes Sarah. Both words mean princess. But Sarah gets a new name. She's a new kind of princess. She's the one who will be the mother of kings, the ancestor of kings. They get a new name because they're different people and they have a new role. And the good news of our faith is that in relationship with God, we are made new. Paul put it this way. He said, in Christ, we are new creations. We're made new. We're different. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. It's newness of life that stands at the heart of the covenant with God. We get a new name. We are called Christians, those who follow Christ, those who seek to live as Jesus lived and as Jesus taught, those who have experienced the grace of God that Jesus offers time and time and time again. We have a new name. And no matter what name we may have called ourselves or heard ourselves called, no matter what label we may have placed on our own lives or someone has placed on us, we have a name. A new name that signifies God's covenant faithfulness and love to us. The third thing we see is that God is not ageist. God does not practice ageism. People of all ages in scripture are called to faithfulness and to the covenant and are called to particular service. That's so important. We see very young kings like Uzziah or Josiah, 16 years old each, when they're called to be leaders, not just political leaders, religious leaders as well, spiritual leaders. And we see on the other end of the spectrum, the prophet Anna, who we meet in Luke, who at age 84 answers the call. And we see Abraham and Sarah in advanced age, responding to God's call and living in covenant faithfulness to God. We live in a society that forgets the value of age. Just Celebrate one of those decade birthdays and you'll get cards that will remind you. Oh, they're funny and they're a lot of fun, but there's an underlying message. I got a sympathy card when I turned 40 from one of my beloved church members that said, you are being thought of in this time of loss. Loss. What does that say? Or I got a card that said, um, takes a long time for a man to reach green pastures, and when the time comes, he's unable to climb over the fence. How nice is that? Or those, you know those lists of, you know you're getting old when? I got tons of those. You've probably seen some of them. 
You know, you're getting old when you consider taking the mat tag off the mattress your act of rebellion. You know, you're getting old when you actually have medicine in your medicine cabinet. You know, you're getting old when your little black book contains names that only end in MD. Um, when the gleam in your eye is the sun reflecting on your bifocals. Uh, when you get winded playing chess. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. All reflecting at some level, although we have fun with it, reflecting at some level that there is loss there, that you're over the hill and on the downhill side, or downhill slide, as the case may be, and that somehow things are just not as good on that other side. And perhaps your role is diminished on that other side. But the biblical image is quite different. And it stands in contrast to the way that we often view our elders in our society and the way we treat the elders in our society. There is a moving poem written by uh, uh, Leona Caldwell. And in that poem, she describes what she is feeling about being elderly. She said, Old age is valued in ancient castles and antique furniture and heirloom silver and aged Swiss cheese and vintage wine and golden rings and weathered covered bridges. Old age is valued in everything she writes, except me. We must in the church be leaders in helping change those kinds of perceptions. In doing what scripture does time again, and that is valuing those of advanced age. Proverbs 16.31 says uh, that a gray head is a crown of glory. You might want to jot that down. A gray head is a crown of glory. Uh, Leviticus says, rise up in the presence of the gray headed and give honor to the aged. We could learn from that. We could also learn from Abraham and Sarah that no matter at what age we have the ability to answer God's call, to be who God calls us to be, to, to deepen our faith, to go on a new faith journey, to take a new direction in life. Age is not the issue. And then finally, the good news is that all of this is about a journey. It's not about the destination, it's about a journey. When the covenant is fulfilled for them, they haven't reached a destination. It's just a new phase of their journey. And it's been a journey all the way for Abraham and Sarah, just as it is for us. A journey that has its ups and its downs, it has its mountain peaks and its dark valleys, but all along the way, it's a journey and God is faithful in it and present in it every step of the way. Our lives are like that. Our lives have their ups and downs. They have their peaks and their valleys. But it's all a journey. Abraham and Sarah have their moments when they are so faithful and you just are impressed with their trust. And then they have other moments where you scratch your head and say, what are they thinking? And it's true for us. We have those great moments when we feel close when all is right with the world and we make good decisions and we're wise and we have those moments when those who know us say, what in the world were you thinking? But God is with us every step of the way, leading us and walking with us and walking behind us to catch us when we stumble. That is our covenant God, ever faithful. Let's pray. Gracious God, 
As we go forward from this place, help us to know your faithfulness, to know that underneath us are your everlasting arms, and that every step of the way throughout our lives, no matter at what age, you are working in our lives and you are call us to be, calling us to be your people in the world. Oh God, enable us by your grace to answer the call that we might be faithful to the covenant. In Jesus' name, amen.